This is the day that has been given to us. Rather than creating it, earning it, or deserving it, we receive this day as a gift, a gift from the universe, a gift from God, a gift from life itself. As we gather today online and in person, let us receive the gift of this day and make of it a time to recommit to our highest ideals and our deepest commitments. In our freely covenanted faith of Unitarian Universalism, we know that it is the shared commitments of our covenant, not any creed or belief, that bind us together in beloved community and inspire us to faithful service. So as we enter our time of worship this day, one hour early, <laughs> at the Birmingham Unitarian Church, Let's join together in giving voice to the promise of this congregation's covenant. As part of this beloved BUC community, I promise to strive to be my best self in all my interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications, Pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. An hour earlier, <laughs> and we're all here, and you're here, thank you. It's good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, remotely via Zoom, or watching this recording later, it is so great to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, we will project the image it is important for us to learn and be a part of this online and in-person uh, group. We will project the image of folks who are currently on Zoom up here on our screen, and we'll ask them to turn their cameras on, even in their jimmy jammies, <laughs> and wave to us, because we want to see your waves. Now we who are gathered in person We'll turn to face the camera in the back and give them a wave back. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day we are Birmingham Unitarian Church and we are building the beloved community. We welcome our 
guests this morning, those who might be visiting us, and we want to make sure that we get to know you. So, Reverend Posa and I will be in the uh, pavilion, and we hope you'll introduce yourself to us and then share a cup of coffee with us in Hodas Hall. Our chalice lighting this morning is from Reverend Audette Fulbright Fulson. This light we kindle is set in the lamp of our history. We inherit this free faith from the brave and gentle, fierce and outspoken hearts and minds that have come before us. Let us be worthy inheritors of this faith and through our good works, pass it boldly to a new generation. We join with other universal, Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice this morning. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our first hymn this morning. It's when our heart is in a holy place, number 1008. Apologies for the mask, but I assure you it is for you far more than it is for me as I recover from this chest cold. And we are gathering today to continue lifting up the theme of generosity in our congregation as we continue with our month of stewardship, our annual pledge drive here at BUC. Uh, take a look out in the foyer as you leave and see the, the poster that's up and all of the faces that have been added to it to represent all of the pledges that have already been received. We'll be reflecting on uh, how our generosity together can empower us to spread more generosity in the world and in a particular way today 
but we have other ways of lifting up generosity coming out throughout the month. And I'm particularly excited for my first time next Sunday to see how this congregation experiences an act of generosity that was shared many years ago with you and how you celebrate it still today. Daffodil Sunday is coming next Sunday. And for those who are new as I am uh, and are not familiar with this, please join. Uh, from what I understand, I'm looking forward to it. And I think you will too. Uh, I'll also note, just looking ahead briefly, we're gonna be varying something as well. One aspect of our generosity that many of you engaged in today already, and thank you, was bringing supplies for our Action Sunday that's coming up. And uh, we'll ha that's a Sunday when we join together for a social action project more than a traditional worship. And we normally do that on the fifth Sundays we are on this month of five Sundays, shifting it to the fourth Sunday, March 24th. Why? Because the fifth Sunday is one that the tradition out of which we grew celebrates as a holiday. So we'll be reflecting on that day on how Easter can be meaningful to us as Unitarian Universalists today. But let us celebrate how we can be reminded of our generosity of spirit and how that can spread. And to do so, I'm going to invite our uh, DRE Shannon to come forward for our uh, Time for All Ages. Shannon. So in the last few months, we've heard several stories about black children who bravely fought for civil rights and desegregation. And among them, we heard stories of Cheyenne Webb and Ruby Bridges. As we're entering the month where we honor women's history, we want to share another story of a woman who gave her life to embody our principles of peace, liberty, justice, and the inherent worth and dignity of everyone. The protesters sang and chanted on the 50 mile march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. The black people of Selma had tried to march earlier in the month to demonstrate for African American voting rights and in remembrance of Jimmy Lee Jackson, a young black man who was killed a few weeks before during another peaceful protest. However, the earlier protest was called off when the marchers were met by police officers who beat them and imprisoned them. Now, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was leading a new protest march to the state capitol, and marchers planned to let nothing stop them. Among these marchers were hundreds of Unitarian Universalists, including the Reverend James Reeb. The marchers' numbers had grown by over 20,000. Many people saw the televised coverage of Bloody Sunday when the first march was brutally attacked. Many had heard the call from Reverend King for lovers of justice to come to Selma and join the march. One of the many who saw and heard was Viola Liuzzo, a 39-year-old white woman. She went to Selma to support the cause of civil rights. Her car was in Selma too, being used to pick up the old and weak who started the march but could not finish. After the march, she helped carpool supporters to the airport, bus, and train stations for their journey home. But Viola herself would not be going home. Home for Viola was Detroit, Michigan. She saw how white people and black people lived in two different worlds and she wondered why people thought she couldn't be friends with black people. All that thinking helped Viola shape firm opinions about what is right, wrong, and fair. Once she made her mind up, nobody was gonna turn her around. So she worked for economic justice and education reform in Detroit. She worked for civil rights with the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, alongside her black friends. When she did not see her beliefs and values reflected in the Catholic church she attended, 
she left and joined the first Unitarian Universalist Church of Detroit. When Viola saw what was happening in Selma and heard Reverend King's call, nothing was gonna stop her from doing what she believed she had to do, go down to Selma and support the march. As a mother of five children, Viola had many responsibilities at home. So once she made up her mind to go, she called her husband and told him her plans. And he was worried. Viola, it might be dangerous. I know, she replied. Viola, you might get killed, he said. I know, she answered. This isn't your fight, he pleaded. It's everybody's fight, she asserted. Before anybody else could try and talk her out of it, Viola was in her station wagon and heading to Alabama. She held hands with black people and white people, crossed the bridge, and marched three strong. She offered her car to be used as needed. Later that night, after the march was finished, Viola was helping marchers get home. As she and Leroy Moten, a black civil rights worker, drove along Highway 80, a car full of white supremacist men from the Ku Klux Klan began following and threatening her. She became frustrated and started singing freedom songs at the top of her lungs. 20 miles later, the men were still on her tail, and along a lonely stretch of road, they pulled up next to her car and shot her. They shot Viola and killed her because she was a white woman trying to help black people claim their civil rights. They thought this would stop the civil rights movement, but like a mighty tide, it kept on rolling toward freedom. Many people were outraged by Viola's murder and more pressure was put on legislators in Washington, D.C. to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Viola's dedication to her values and her sacrifice brought all of us a little bit closer to freedom. Further, the American Civil Rights Movement has inspired and oppressed people all over the world. Viola Liuzzo was the only white woman honored on the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. A memorial plaque honoring Viola Liuzzo, Jimmy Lee Jackson, and James Reeb hangs at the national offices of the Unitarian Universalist Association in Boston, Massachusetts. Back home in Michigan, the city of Detroit has also honored Viola Liuzzo's legacy. In 1982, a park in the Greenfield neighborhood was named after her. A huge revitalization project began in 2016 to make this space even more beautiful and functional. A statue of Viola was commissioned by a sculptor, Austin Brantley, and in 2019, it was installed at the park. A monument dedicated to Viola Liuzzo and her dear friend, Sarah Evans, was just unveiled last summer. Viola had asked her friend, Sarah, to help care for her children while she was away in Alabama. When she never returned, Sarah continued to support the Liuzzo family and cared for the children as they aged into adulthood. The community that holds the Viola Liuzzo playground has a profound appreciation for her work and is inspired by her sacrifice to make positive change for others. I invite you to visit the park sometime this month. As you're visiting this space, take a moment to reflect on her life and the lives of so many others who loved the hell out of the world. At this time, our children and youth will join their adult facilitators at the back of the sanctuary and head off to class.
mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in the areas of environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's recipient is Freedom House. They have provided a video to share with us this morning. Hi, my name Hi, is my Marie, Marie Laurie. I'm, I'm a member, member of the U Church of Farmington, and, 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 and I'm here to talk to you today to about, about Freedom, Freedom House. House. I've been, I've a, been a volunteer with Freedom, Freedom House since about 2016, in various, various capacities. capacities. It is a, it place, is a place that is that more full of pain, pain and, and more full of hope, hope and, and joy than, than any other place I've ever experienced. It's a delight working with the residents of Freedom House. Freedom House, Freedom House offers, offers full wraparound services, services to asylum, to asylum seekers, seekers here in Detroit. Detroit. It, offers it offers housing, housing uh, medical, medical care, care counseling, counseling for, trauma, for trauma, legal, legal support, support, food, food uh, English, English lessons, lessons um, um, help, help finding, finding a job, job and getting and paperwork done. It offers, it offers everything, everything, which is a which real, is a real help, help for asylum seekers. seekers. Asylum, asylum seekers are a subset, subset of, of refugees. refugees. You, you have a right, have a right. You, have an you have an international right, right. Everyone, everyone does, to apply, to apply for asylum, for asylum in, in another country, country if your life, your life is in danger, danger in the country, country you're, you're, in. you're in. So an asylum, so an asylum seeker, seeker is someone, someone who comes, comes here, here and applies, applies to, stay to stay here because, because it's not, not safe for them to go back, home. back home. We are seeing, we are seeing more, and more and more asylum, asylum seekers, seekers, as you know, as you know from the news all across the country, and Detroit is no exception. Freedom House, Freedom House offers, offers housing, housing and it holds about 60, 60 people, people and has, and has for quite a while. A while. Um, they um, they have, have 200 people in the program, program right, right now, and they're getting and they're 15, 15 new people, people a week. People, people are just showing up at the door, the door with nowhere, with nowhere else, else to go, go needing, needing everything. everything. When you when you leave a country, leave a country under conditions, under conditions like asylum seekers, seekers do, you have to leave everything behind. You don't show up with luggage. You don't show up sometimes with your own paperwork. You show up with yourself and what you're wearing. So they need everything when they get the door, the door and freedom, freedom house is able to provide, provide that. that. We are, we are asking you, you to, to help to support, support Freedom House. Freedom House. Um, um, any way any that way you can support, can support them, them monetarily, monetarily or with goods, goods is, is amazing and helpful. And helpful. Right, right now, um, people, people are coming, are coming from, from mostly from Venezuela, from Venezuela, Venezuela Colombia, Colombia uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, Democratic, Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo, of Congo and, Benin, and Benin. But people but come from all over the world, world for a variety, variety of reasons. reasons. All of them need our support. And all of them are grateful for anything that you can do. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and Freedom House to build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Among our spiritual practices here at Birmingham Unitarian Church is the sharing with one another of those joys and those sorrows that have impacted us in recent days. And we do have a joy to share on behalf of uh, several members of our choir who yesterday had the pleasure of experiencing our wonderful pianist recital at University of Michigan, where she's a doctoral student. To say it was great is an understatement. It was awesome. <laughs> and we have sorrows as well. And in particular, uh, Pat Betkowitz lifts up, still feeling overwhelmed from still feeling overwhelmed by the death of my brother Bob from a massive stroke, only 67 years old, and adds, may we appreciate what we have and mourn what we do not. And these sorrows and joys of our lives expressed as well as those we have not yet shared, may we be present with one another and in our beloved community of care and support. Now, we have in recent months explored spiritual practices that engage other aspects of our beings. So I invite us to an embodied practice today, but stay seated. I just invite you to close your eyes or soften your gaze as you feel comfortable. And imagine, imagine there is a comforting stream of light coming from above you and moving first through the top of your head. And feel this light make its way down your face, down the back of your neck, Notice it on your shoulders as it flows down your chest, your arms, your torso, and gradually your legs all the way to your feet. And as it does, allow this light slowly to flow through your body, particularly to any place you may be holding tension. And this light finds that place of tension. Imagine that it warms the tight muscles, allowing them to release. Feel the blood come back to that area of your body. Feel the warmth the healing. Breathe slowly, breathe deeply, and feel the relief this healing light brings to our bodies and to our spirit. And now for a time of deeper sharing as we prepare to hear these prayerful words by the Reverend Dr. Maureen Kaloran. I invite you to reach deep within yourself, to reach far beyond yourself and connect with what you know as sacred. Spirit of life and of love, God known in so many ways, mystery beyond all knowing. This prayer 
is for all. For all who are fearful about the economy, the fate of our country, health care for yourself or your children, for all whose heart aches at the injustices being done to others in our name, for all who fear for the survival of the planet, for all who fear whether they will be allowed to enter or to leave or to remain. We make this prayer for all who deal daily with failing health, difficult diagnoses, challenging treatments or healthcare routines, for all who struggle with difficulties at school or work, for all who are facing hard decisions, for all who are living in challenging relationship, we make this prayer for ourselves, for all the fears and concerns and the joys and celebrations. We make this prayer for the children, for their future, and for the every blooming possibilities of spring. We make this prayer to hold in our hearts all the precious blessings of our lives. And we make this prayer not because we expect it to make the world turn or change, we make this prayer to remind ourselves of who we are, of what life is, and how important love can be. We make this prayer because these words are what we need. Blessed may we all be. Amen. Now will you please join me in a time of silence. First reading this morning comes from Sonnets to Orpheus II, Poem 29, by Rainier Maria Rilke. Quiet friend who has come so far, feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. 
As you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into this change. What is it like? Such intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow. To the rushing water, speak, I am. This next reading was written by the Unitarian Universalist Minister, Reverend Joanna Fontaine Crawford. It's from her blog post entitled, To Love the Hell Out of the World. To love the hell out of the world means to see with our hearts, fragile and unprotected, to accept that life is shattering and excruciating, to see the hell in a world in a group, in a person, in a tear. To know that it is the experience of both the oppressor and the oppressed, as we are both. To wade into it, armored for battle, but leaving our heart completely exposed, because that is what we follow. It is our night goggles in a dark world of smoke falling beams, and faint cries from over there. We love emphatically, actively, with our hands and feet, pushing the wreckage aside, reaching down, stretching until we fear our arms can go no further, but they do. We touch fingers with others, then grab on for dear life pulling them out to safety, then going back in to remove the hell itself before it traps someone else. We round a corner only to find hands waiting for us, to pull us to safety, to warmth, for we are both the savior and the saved.
Well, we speak of hell on earth. And I can't help but be reminded that Viola Liuzzo was someone who knew something about hell on earth. Viola grew up very poor in a poor white family during the Great Depression, and most of her upbringing was in rural parts of East Tennessee and Georgia. Her family moved frequently. They were trying to outrun even worse economic hardships than many people around them. Uh, her father lost his hand as a coal miner, and that prevented him from working much in those days. So the family fell on very hard times. But even at a young age, Viola understood that some folk around her faced even harder times still. When she was six years old, her mother was managing a store in Georgia. And one day, Viola took money out of the cash register to give to a young girl, a young black girl, whose family had even less money than they did. Her sense of justice carried with her throughout her life, including through her teen years when the family moved to Michigan. Her father had found work in a bomb factory at the beginning of World War II, and Viola soon found work in Detroit. And as an adult, she became involved in union organizing, eventually marrying the Teamsters organizer, Anthony Liuzzo, as well, as we've already heard, as working for racial justice causes in what you know better than I do was at that time a pretty bitterly segregated city. Indeed, shortly after she became a Unitarian Universalist, uh, she joined First UU Detroit in 1964. She traveled to New York with her best friend of 20 years, whom we've already heard about, Sarah Evans. Imagine this white woman and black woman traveling together in the mid-60s from Detroit to New York to attend a United Nations seminar on civil rights that the UUA co-sponsored. Viola Liuzzo lamented the too many people who just stand around talking. Those are her direct words. And she made sure she never became such a person herself. And that was in that context, again, as we heard earlier, in late February and early March of 65, that she heard about Selma, the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson, that vicious violence uh, against the marchers on Bloody Sunday, Dr. King's call for people of goodwill to travel to Selma in solidarity. Those moved Viola, and she answered King's call, along with hundreds of other UU clergy and lay people, and yes, including the Reverend James Reeb, plus thousands of others. Viola once again took the road, driving down to Selma, and yes, like Reverend Reeb, Viola Liuzzo did not return. She and Reeb and Jackson, the martyrs of Selma as we know them now, brought their presence and they gave their lives to the cause of justice. In this way, Liuzzo died as she lived with integrity. Viola Liuzzo's life and death strike me as dramatic yet real examples of what it means in the words of this congregation's mission to encourage lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. As we reflect in this stewardship season on what it means for us to care for our church community as it enters this period of transition, Certainly, we're considering what it means for us to be together, to be in community with one another, be it virtually, face-to-face, -face, or increasingly both. I've attended so many meetings in just the six weeks I've been here where uh, we have gathered both in person in the large conference room and streamed in on Zoom. Those values call us also to live in accordance with them every day, not just when we're at church. So what does it mean for us and how can we support this church in supporting all of us to take our UU faith out into the world? I'm reminded of a quote from a, uh, let's just call it a often misapplied quote. 
where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's one of those often quoted biblical aphorisms from the Sermon on the Mount, and it's one of far too many Bible verses that on its own is perfectly fine, but is widely misinterpreted. Popular overuse aside, though, what I hear Jesus pointing out in that aphorism is that our treasure follows our heart. It's not that we need treasure as individuals to create space for our hearts to rest. That's not it. Rather, it's the movement of our hearts. It's the flow of our mutual love that creates heart space and the flow of our material treasures trails behind and loves wake. For when we connect with others with whom we show love, we transform these into spaces worth maintaining, worth supporting through our financial resources. Money may not instigate the creation of heart space, of a place to rest in beloved community and be strengthened for the loving acts to come, but it can and does reinforce such spaces as our financial treasures strengthen our policies, our staffing, our programs, and our ministries. And I'll share again the quote I shared last week from Dan Hotchkiss. Money is not in itself sacred, but when we approach the sacred in our world, money is often close at hand. Our treasures strengthen our church so that the church may better equip and empower us, separately and together, to go out and strengthen the world as Unitarian Universalists, the stronger, the more healthy, the more vibrant, and yes, the better financed a church can be, the more it can help us. But help us to do what? Well, it bears repeating that we, you use, are the inheritors of that great tradition of universalism. It's the tradition that rejected eternal hell, which lifted up the deep, an inalienable divine love for every single soul. Rather than emphasizing as, Unitarian, as Unitarianism has the inherent goodness of all humanity, universalism flows from the love that's stronger than death. Whether or not we feel lovable, whether or not we actually are lovable is actually beside the point we are loved. We are offered and we receive the gift of love in our lives, just as we receive the gift of the day, as I con consistently name in the beginning of worship. Yet, in this world, in our post-insurrection and post-climate change world, recognition is growing among us that we have to do something to respond to the many aspects of the world as it is that falls short of the world as it should be. Just give me a second. <clears throat> I don't know any UUs who act today who actually believe in the kind of afterlife that could be called hell. Yet a concept of hell, a metaphorical concept, not a literal one, is becoming useful once again Rather than the old dogma of eternal damnation in the next life, we are responding to those hellish states of existence that people experience in this life. In this world with so much violence and racism, poverty and depression, pandemic and addiction, we no longer need eternal hell because too many current day hells pervade this world. And affirming the core universalist principle that every person is loved beyond measure by a love so powerful that some know it is God, that now calls us to spread that love in ways that ease the suffering of those around us because we are called to love the hell out of the world. Now that phrase, love the hell out of the world, actually became something of a new catchphrase some years ago among Unitarian Universalists who were committed to putting our faith into action and also 
to understanding why our faith guides our actions. It was first articulated in a UU context 14 years ago by the author of the blog post we heard as one of our readings, Reverend Joanna Fontaine Crawford. Uh, she serves a church in the suburbs of Austin, Texas, and full disclosure, she's one of my best friends. <laughs> but she's not alone. Recent, a recent Google search turned up at least 20 UU ministers who had written sermons or blog posts on loving the hell out of the world. Now, Reverend Crawford herself explains the concept this way. The hell is all around, and we work in great passionate swoops and in slow, plodding routines to put that extravagant love into action and remove all the bits of it from this world. We are the only form love will take, and the work is ours to do. At its most fundamental level, love is not so much a feeling, it's an action, action driven by care. This call to love the hell out of the world is to love it in ways that truly drive out some pieces of the hell within it in particular contexts. Let me name two examples, two of the many hellish states of existence that have particular resonance for us now. And we've been hearing so much about the civil rights era and the ways in which racism were addressed. And again, you know better than I do the particular legacy of racism in Detroit. I come from the South, which everyone knows has its own struggles with racism. And yet, Though the details may vary from one geographic context to the next, may play out differently in the 2020s than they did in the 1960s, we know there is this underlying culture that tries to subtly enforce the idea that those of us who are white are somehow above others. And often, even in the most subtle of things, such as privileging the ways of doing things that correlate with how white people operate more than how folks of other races have developed culturally over the years, decades, centuries. And there has been a vital conversation, albeit an uncomfortable one, at times over the last seven years in particular within Unitarian Universalist circles, lifting up this sometimes disconcerting phrase about white supremacy and how we, in ways we usually don't intend, sometimes inadvertently play into that culture and inadvertently reinforce it. But it's been my experience that younger generations of progressives are increasingly seeking communities that take the internal work against racism seriously. And it is work that so many of our congregations are engaging. And while, again, it's not always the most comfortable work, I have seen it be rewarding in countless ways for you use. The other hell on earth worth noting today in particular is that of transphobia. And many of us are aware that there was one case in particular among so many that has gotten particular special attention of a young non-binary teenager in Oklahoma, an ex-Benedict, who died the day after being beaten by classmates in high school. And while the cause of death is not yet fully determined, there is a certain, certainly a likelihood of a connection between the two. And whether that's the case for next or not, we know that so many other trans people have been assaulted, have been ostracized, have been marginalized in countless ways. And again, I see an increasing desire among people, especially in generations younger than my own, to take that particular hell of transphobia on directly 
and work to root it out, not only from amongst ourselves, but out of our world. And the congregations that I have seen be more successful at brought, bringing young people in in recent years have been those that have been obvious in their work in these two areas and other similar ones. So how can we love the hells of white supremacy and transphobia out of our corner of the world, as well as other hells? This, not, this need not mean all the world, but again, in specific contexts, it can mean a place where we have a particular connection. But most especially, it means loving the hell out of where we are, out of Oakland County, out of one another's lives. And for some of us, this means organizing with groups like Moosejit, like Freedom House, to advocate uh, for those uh, in need of support as asylum seekers, those seeking racial and gender justice, etc. For others, it's visiting church members in the hospital. It's teaching in our RE program. It's singing in the choir. For all of us, it means continuing to build this church into the place where we can grow in our vulnerability, safe enough to be nurtured, yet challenged enough to stretch beyond any complacency in our lives and in our spirits. Viola Liuzzo and all the others who fought and marched in Selma truly loved the hell out of the world as they lived in it and in her case and others as they died in it. Living now near her home city of Detroit, I could not pass up the opportunity to pay homage to this person who has so inspired me as a fellow UU over the years, which is why two days ago, when frankly I was not yet well enough to actually do it, I traveled to a place that you've already heard mentioned, Viola Liuzzo Park. Those are photos I took on Friday. And I'm sure many of you have been there. Many of you will recognize the statue of Liuzzo, and uh, particularly those who have been in recent months, the new memorial that lifts up both Viola and her dear friend Sarah. They exemplified what it means to love the hell out of the world. And Viola Liuzzo especially exemplified Unitarian Universalism at its best. The willingness to stand beside our brothers, our siblings, and sisters of so many faiths, of so many races, from so many states. That spirit of abounding and embodied love is what lifts us out of our complacency and our cynicism. It inspires us to reach out to one another, to reach out to our neighbors, to reach out to heal this world. So may this church, may BUC continue to live into that call, to live into that love that is the antidote to our hellish experiences, and may it call us to connect with one another, in Reverend Crawford's words, extravagantly, wastefully, with an overpowering abandon and fervor that sometimes surprises even yourself, and may our support of this church allow it to continue to transform our lives as we seek ever new and greater ways to love the hell out of this world. So may it be for us all. Well, please uh, rise in body or spirit, and as we contemplate ways that we can change our world beyond these walls, let's sing the hell out of this hymn to close it up. I've got peace like a river.
So as we leave this sacred time, as we leave the many sacred spaces where we have gathered, may we carry with us the blessings, the gifts of gratitude for the nurturing of our spirits and community, of humility when we fall short of our highest aspirations, and of resilience to strengthen our resolve. With these, may we go forth to serve this hurting world in the spirit of love. Go in peace.